stand as we get ready to worship? Shh. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence here this evening. We ask God that you would come and be with us as we worship. You're worthy of these words we're going to sing. You're worthy of the melody of our voices we raise. Bless us, Father, as we worship you this evening. Say we love you. Be 
Jesus, would you set your seal upon our hearts that we would love you more. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Give them a round of applause. It's a Friday afternoon. We're here. Josh just brought that podium. I'm, we're ready to do the mission statement. All right. You guys ready for this? Stay standing. We're doing the mission statement now. I want to hear you belt it out as loud as you can. I used to do this with youth groups. You got to just belt it out. Are you ready? Here we go. The IHOP community exists to partner in the Great Commission by advancing 24-7 prayer with worship, by proclaiming the beauty of Jesus and his glorious return. Well done, guys. Good job. Good job. All right, uh, so stay standing, greet somebody, give them a high five or whatever, and uh, we'll, you know. So then Kurt comes up. Yeah, you call him up. Yeah. Yeah. Just stay here and call him up. Yeah, well, I let him stay here. Yeah, yeah. I just let him. Yeah. I got you. I think. My thoughts are like give them like so like the two minutes you think you're longer than two minutes three or four okay I felt super tuned in yesterday. Okay. Everybody grab your seat and grab your Bible. Real quickly, we're going to do one of our famous activation times. Who's excited about that? Activation. Let's hear it. Come on. Okay. We have a little simple process that we use to minister in the Holy Spirit. We use it at the altar teams. We use it uh, in, in our prophecy healing rooms. It's a very simple process. It's made up of five steps. Basically, presence, partnering, permission, power, and when you're finished, praise. And so the five Ps of simple ministry in the Holy Spirit. Presence, partnering, permission, power, and praise. And so we're going to use this right now by everybody stand up, grab your Bible, have your Bible with you. I heard a groan. Oh, it's that hard to stand up, guys? Really? Seriously?
And we're gonna start with presence. Just ask the Spirit of the Lord to come upon you right now. I've asked these guys to just play a little while we're, while we're doing that. Just, you're gonna invoke the presence onto yourself, okay? And it's as simple as what's always been done throughout the ages. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Holy Spirit, come upon me. So just rest in his presence right now. Don't lay down. Rest in his presence right now and ask for the Spirit of the Lord to come upon you. Moses saw this way, way back when several started prophesying and Joshua got a little scared and jealous and Moses says, oh, that all God's people were prophets and his spirit were upon them all. Well, we live in the day when the spirit is upon all the people of God. So let his spirit come upon you right now. Okay, now stay in that through the rest of this time. You're now going to move about the room, moving away from people you know to get in a group with three other people that you don't know. Don't get into a group of five. Don't get into a group of three. Get into a group of four people, you being one of them, okay? So just move around the room. Find three other people that you don't know. Come on, leaders. Be bold. Step out. Model this. Help the body. Get with a group of people you don't know. Stay in that presence mode. If you have two and you need two more, hold up two fingers. If you have three and you need one more, hold up one finger. And then just grab a person when they walk by. Get into a group of four people. It's not gonna work with six people. Some of you, this is hard for you. Four, it's the number four. Get into a group of four, not five, not three, not six. Four, four. If you're standing there alone, you need to move and find three other people. Shouldn't take long. Look around, if you're not in a group, look around for somebody who's got a finger up and that's the person you're supposed to be added to them. Four, not five, not three, four. Okay, now, if you've lost the Holy Spirit upon you, just pause a minute, ask the Spirit of the Lord, come upon me. Holy Spirit, come upon me right now. Okay, now you're gonna look with your spirit. This is called beholding. The Lord wants to engage our spiritual sense of sight right now. The word behold is used over 1,800 times in the English version of the Bible. It's always a calling to see by the Spirit. So look with your spirit right now. Ask the Lord for a scripture verse. You can take the first one that comes to mind. You can wait, but grab onto a scripture verse right now. Maybe it's one that's come up over and over this week. Maybe it's one you're just meditating on. Just grab onto a scripture verse. Maybe it was your devotional. Maybe it's something you heard sung in the prayer room. Just grab onto a scripture verse right now. Okay, you got it? Now I want two of you in the group of four to raise your hands right away. Two of you, raise your hands right away. All right? You two that have your hands up are a partnership. Now stand next to one another. You just partnered with someone. Okay. Now I want the two of you to point to one of the other two people. Right now, just point to one of the other two people. The same person, both of you point to the same person, okay? I'm just kinda injecting the voice of the Lord in right now. Okay, you got this. All right. Now, back to the presence. Keep the presence of the Lord in front of you. And 
one by one, you're going to share this verse that you got to that one person, the two of you are. So just share that verse. And what I like to do is look at a phrase in the verse and speak that over them. Not as a God would you, but I believe you are doing this. You will do this. Okay, now remember, this is simple prophecy. It's for edification, comfort, all right? And exhortation. It's not for direction, correction, and rebuke, okay? Simple prophecy is to build. So if your Bible verse is negative or your language is tempted to be negative, ask the Lord how he would speak over them. Remember, you're talking to Jesus's bride right now. Be careful how you treat his bride, okay? So I want you to minister that verse, the two of you, over that one person right now. Ready, go. You have two minutes. There's a group migrating right now. Where are you guys going? <laughs> They're going to McDonald's to prophesy over. Okay, you have one minute left for the two of you to finish ministering to that person. Okay, 30 seconds left. All right, now we're going to reset. Everybody stay in your group. Focus on the Lord, ask the Spirit of the Lord to come upon you again. Sometimes we forget to keep him engaged. Holy Spirit, come upon me right now. Now, the two people who did not raise their hands the first time, raise your hands now. Remember, you're in a group of four, so two people raised their hands the first time. The other two, raise your hands now. You're now the ministry team, okay? Those two who have their hands raised point to one of the other two people. You're gonna minister your verse to them, okay? Okay, now begin ministering that verse over them. Again, not just, Lord, would you, but I believe you will. Build up, edify, comfort, encourage the body right now.
You have just two minutes more. Thirty seconds more. Good. All right, everybody finish up, turn and face me. One more exercise, real quick, turn and face me. Anyone that needs physical healing in your body, raise your hand and hold it up straight. When I say raise your hand, make sure your elbow is straight, unless that's what you need physical healing for. Just raise your hand so the elbow is straight. So you're up in the air, okay? Some of you need prayer for your elbows, okay? Hold that hand up until two people are next to you laying hands on you gently, appropriately. Lay hands on that person gently, appropriately. No pushing, no shoving, no inappropriate touch. I want two people around every person with their hand raised. So move. Move till you have two. If you've got five, look around for somebody who doesn't have anybody praying for them. Get two at least around everyone. All right? Now, this is critical to the body of Christ. We have a lot of sicknesses, a lot of unusual sicknesses happen, and we want to contend for a minute or two for their healing, speaking words of life over them right now. We have actually seen in Prophecy Healing Rooms a number of profound healings recently, this week. We're believing for a wave of move of physical healing. Now we're not gonna get into inner healing. You're just laying your hands on them. Speak words of life. Ask God to heal them immediately or proclaim healing over them. Don't expect them to do anything but receive. They don't have to repent of everything. I mean, they know from the Spirit if they have to repent of something, but you don't have to tell them that. You just speak words of life and speak healing over them right now. We need to contend for the body, beloved. There's real uh, urgency in this, in the body. So use your words to speak life and power over them. Ask them what's wrong and speak immediately. Prayer for that, for healing over them. Go. Those of you who aren't praying for everyone, begin anyone, begin to lift your voice to the Lord. God, we ask you to heal this body. Lord, we ask you to heal the body of Christ right now throughout the earth. If you're watching on the internet, Lord, come and touch people right now with power, with supernatural power. We believe that your word is good. We believe for life and health on the body right now. We contend. Break the fear of cancer right now in the name of Jesus. Release your prophetic word to heal right now in Jesus' name. Right now, immediately manifest your power on your people. I want everyone, if you're not touching someone, to just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, help. We need your help in the body right now. Release your healing power.
Father, we thank you for healing. Bless these ones in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can find your way back to your seats. And while you're doing that, we'll love to have David Slyker make his way up. Go ahead and wrap up. All right, so Dave. Yes, sir. We have new students. We have 152 new students. That's incredible. Yeah. We have uh, 85 new students on campus. We have 65 new students online. And just for the on-campus students, just for fun, we've, we're welcoming students yesterday and today. We're welcoming them. Wel welcome, I can't talk. We're welcoming them. If you're wondering what we're doing, we're welcoming them. We're welcoming students from Brazil, Mozambique, China, Korea, South Africa, Finland, Germany, Guatemala, Canada, Taiwan, Belgium, uh, Singapore. We have students from all over the world that we're welcoming right now that are in our midst. So fun, so sweet. We're so excited, the IHOP U team, our IHOP KC family, we're so excited. This is a this is a big day, we love this. And so I'll, I'll tell you two quick stories just for fun. One of our students is a 71 year old Chinese missionary to Turkey. That's what, she's a freshman, 71 year old Chinese missionary from Turkey. She so finished cool. Chinese CBETS actually. She finished <laughs> the CBETS course and at the end of it said, I wanna go to IHOP U. She's 71, That's missionary amazing. in Turkey. <laughs> Another one of our freshmen is a 50 plus year old church planner from Taiwan that the Lord speaks to him. He hands his ministry to the young guys and says, I'm going to go get trained. And so he's here. That's incredible. To get trained. We're just, come on. Isn't that <laughs> Bless fun? That man. That's fun. <laughs> That's fun. So come on. This is a good day. We've got uh, 152 new students. We've got 300 in the school. We have 60 interns that are here and coming throughout the fall. This is fun. We get to do this as a family. We get to host hungry ones that the Lord is stirring up to be with us. So uh, let's, uh, let's enjoy them and host them well. Amen. Hey, uh, before you go, I, can we just take a minute? If you serve in, at IHOPU, faculty, staff, in any sort of way, I know most of them are gone because they're hosting our new students, but could you stand real quick? I would, yeah. I would love for us to just take a minute and pray for these ones as they're going to give themselves to raising up and serving these students. Can you just reach your hand out? Yeah, if you're involved in IHOPU in any way, go yeah. ahead and, go ahead go and, and stand. stand. I want to pray for you. Yeah. So Lord, we ask for grace as we begin this school year, as the, as the new students have arrived, as the different ones are engaging online. God, we're asking for those that serve, for those that are uh, on the front lines of ministering to young and old. We don't wanna just say young people, but these saints, these glorious ones that you're sending. I'm asking for grace, for strength, for freshness of heart. God, we want to feel what you feel and we want to think your thoughts as we serve the ones that you're sending. God, you take this personally. The ones that you're sending, you take it personally. And so I'm asking that you would strengthen and re-energize us with your thoughts and your desires and your plans for these different ones. We want to align with you and be invigorated by your love as we serve in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dave. All right, so we have a couple announcements here. Uh, first one is uh, uh, EGS service on Friday nights at 7.30. How many of you have missed Mike going through John uh, 14, 15, and 16? He is going to be doing that again, picking up next week. So we're super excited about that. So just know that that's happening and, and try to make, uh, make a way for you to come to maybe once a month or maybe you tune in online, however, but those are gonna be so 
So good. Um, next, Tracy Bickle, uh, on our event page on our website, she has a number of programs that are coming out here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, programs for inner healing, for people who have gone through various forms of trauma. Uh, if you know of anybody, or, or you yourself, maybe that's something that you're interested in checking out, or she also has a mentorship program to help walk people through uh, those kind of situations. She has a number of programs she's launching. I, she was gonna be here. I, I, I texted her to see if she was here, and uh, she texted me back a picture of the beach in Seacoast, Florida, where she's presently sitting. So she's not here to make this announcement, uh, but uh, which I thought was, you know, a great way to rub that in because, you know, we're in Missouri. Um, God bless Missouri for any of the Missourians here. But go to the event page on our church website, and you can find out more information. Um, uh, Benji is up here, so I'm assuming you have something to say. I have a prayer request. Uh, you guys know what's happening in Maui, yeah. Hawaii, and there's a lot, a lot of uh, destruction and fires are not stopping. And, and it's, it's personal because it's obviously we love people and we love, there's a lot of churches that have been destroyed. A lot, it's, it's not an exaggeration. A lot of people have been displaced. Some people have died and some people are, especially the el elderly, mm -hmm. are disappearing. Uh, and they, they can't find them because they were not uh, fast enough to escape the fires. And, and one misconception, too, on that, while you're, you're saying that, is often when people think of Maui, they think of, oh, well, rich, wealthy people in their mansions got burned. But people don't understand vacation communities and islands like that. It takes an army to put on all the things that the rich, wealthy people come in for a week to do. This is mostly poor, blue-class, working-class people that are suffering from this. Yeah, and there's, like three main streets that if they get jammed and then you can't escape as fast. So it's very complicated. And part of the people or, or, uh, that are suffering right now and they are trapped in there is uh, Rachel and Wale Gutu, and they, they have been ministering them and, and uh, you know, doing the work of the kingdom in the middle of it. They were not planning on it. And uh, so they've been giving us reports and ask for prayer. So I would like us to pray. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Please lead us. Jesus, have mercy. Yes, Jesus. Lord, extend your mercy yes, over Maui and every inhabitant of that island, Lord. We ask for your mercy. We ask that you will stop this. We ask that you will uh, uh, release a supernatural solution, Lord. A heavy rain that will stop the fire. Yes. Help from the government. Help from people, Lord. But we ask for your help. We ask that you would bless everyone who is in pain and who is um, just trapped right now. Give them escape. Give them escape. Show yourself powerful and merciful. And, and bless our friends, Rachel yes, and Wallace. Yes. Release the power of the kingdom over their hands to yes. heal, to, uh, to just to release hope as they are speaking. Give them words. Strengthen our friends to be light in that moment. And, and the church, release power over the church in Maui in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Benji. Uh, Stuart, this last announcement is for you. Let's look at announcement number 11. We've got the Association of the Recovery of Children with uh, Basil Baz and Tina, his wife. Uh, they uh, came here about a year ago, and they shared a bit of their testimony about how the Lord brought them in to the issue of, uh, of rescue, uh, rescuing children. And uh, they'll be uh, coming back on August, uh, right there on, on number 11, August 25th and August 27th. They're going to be speaking uh, at FC here Friday night at 5 p.m. as well as both services on Sunday. And then on Saturday, um, on the 20, uh, in the afternoon, there's going to be like a, a bit of a seminar uh, with, some, with some question and answers. I just want to invite you guys to come to that. You know, personally, I just think that this is just real critical, of course, and the timing of it, I think, is interesting, especially in light of the, uh, uh, the Sound of Freedom movie that's, uh, that's coming out. And I know that the Lord is just stirring different ones just within our community uh, with regards to this very serious issue. I mean, in fact, uh, the scripture uh, makes it clear that this is going to be a front and center reality um, as the day of the Lord uh, draws near. Uh, Joel chapter 3, Revelation 18, and so forth. And one of the things that, uh, uh, that I appreciate about Baz Abbas and, uh, and Tina 
is that they are, um, I mean, they are involved, actually involved in the rescue of children. And when people think about human trafficking, that's usually what they think about. But there are a wide range of ways that we can all be involved um, and from, from, from the early stage until it's too late stage. And so, so what they're going to share really applies to all of us as a spiritual family. In fact, here in the last year, we've had about uh, Robert, Rob is right there. He's been uh, giving leadership to about 25 to 30 different ones within our spiritual family that are actually praying in some real targeted ways uh, for some very specific situations that they've been involved in with and, and actually seeing the Lord actually answering those prayers. And so just to kind of a heads up, we'll talk more about it next week, but August the 25th. Uh, they'll be coming here at 5 p.m. Um, as well at our and, um, uh, Sunday morning service. And then on Saturday, uh, there will be a, a, a Q&A time as well as a bit of a seminar. So so the ushers come up, but they're going to be offering. You know, in, in Psalm 68, where it says that uh, that he comes, uh, that Jesus comes back as a father for the fatherless. And I believe that one of the expressions of that is him coming back for, uh, for children that are being trafficked um, um, at the end of the age. I mean, this, this is gonna be a real, real crisis. And, and the Lord is stirred up when he comes back to the nations uh, to rescue his people and he'll come to rescue children as well. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Father, thank you for this spiritual family, Lord. We thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you for your provision, Lord, in our lives, Lord, for the way you provide for this spiritual family. Lord, thank you for the grace of giving, Lord, that we can join with you, Father, in that grace. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would bless the sowing and the finances. Father, we ask that you would multiply it, Father, for a harvest of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Hannah. Okay, let's go ahead and turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 15. I just want to take the next few moments and talk about the Father's love for the Son. The Father's love for the Son. John 15. This evening, that's where uh, getting ready to uh, pick up John 13 to 17 again. So this will kind of serve by way of reminder as well as uh, hopefully just to kind of connect with the, reconnect with the importance and the big picture of these, uh, of these five chapters. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. Father, we declare that your nearness is our good. Father, the entrance of your word brings light. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, that as your word, Father, is declared, Lord, we ask you for the light of your presence, Lord, to shine on our hearts. Lord, that you'd illumine our minds, Father, with the light of the Holy Spirit. Father, send light, send truth, lead us, Father, into your presence in greater ways. Lord, that your spirit, Father, would take the things that belong to your son, the treasures of his heart, and make them known to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in um, John uh, 13 to 17, again, it's a passage that is, you know, it's a familiar passage, but in our midst, we are becoming more and more familiar uh, with just the glorious truths that the Lord is highlighting in those five chapters. And, um, and again, the thing that's interesting is that uh, it comes right in the same week uh, when the Lord spoke several days before that in Matthew 24. He uh, shared with his disciples the, the, the unique dynamics of the Lord's return. And then, so this is like Tuesday, and then on Thursday, he, uh, the day before Passover, he is with his disciples for the Passover meal, and he just gives them line upon line glorious truths um, about the heart of God. Now, what's interesting is that in Matthew 24, there are a series of emotions that are being highlighted um, in that chapter, uh, namely uh, a troubled heart. He talks about a troubled heart. He talks about um, a lawless heart. He talks about hearts that grow cold in love. And in many ways, John 13 to 17, Jesus is giving line upon line insight um, as to how we can have our hearts equipped in love, how we can have our hearts equipped in peace, how we can have our hearts equipped in joy. But one of the things that's interesting about these five chapters is that in my opinion, there are, there are at least two pinnacle passages. And uh, the one of them is John 15, 9, it's the, it, where Jesus basically gives us the pinnacle invitation, so to speak, where he, he commands us, and it's, again, it's more than a suggestion, he, he commands us, it's probably the most important commandment in Scripture, to, to abide in the love of God. Uh, to dwell there, to live there, to have our focus there, to have our internal dialogue and conversation in that place. And then I, what I think is the pinnacle experience is found in John 17, 26, where we are brought into the place where we are experiencing uh, towards the Son of God uh, the, the very same love that the Father has for the Son. It's, it's actually quite remarkable in terms, of the pro, in terms of the promise of the capacity to love that is found in these five chapters. Uh, again, to where the experience of our lives would be to experience the love that the Father has for the Son and then to experience that love back to the Son in return. Jesus says in John 15, 9, he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, abide in my love. And so Jesus gives this quality of love. He says, I love you. And you go, okay, that's the, 
uh, that's, as, as it were, that's the quality, so to speak. He said, this is my posture towards you. He goes, but let me give you the standard. Let me give you the capacity by which I am committed to you, the capacity by which I enjoy you. It is in the exact same way that the Father loves me. And, and again, and that's a reality that we um, uh, cannot and must not uh, 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 grow out of. In fact, I believe that the understanding of the Father's love for the Son is truly foundational to, uh, to understanding the nature of the love that we as believers are called to walk in. In fact, what is interesting is it's not an accident that at Jesus' baptism, that that's the issue that the Father thunders from heaven. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the thing that he thunders from heaven, of all the things that he could, that he could have said, of all the things he could have spoken about, all the various uh, uh, social issues that were taking place during that time, all the various political issues that were taking place during that time, all the various religious issues that were taking place, the theological conflict, the social conflict, the international challenges that were taking place just within the land itself, the moral issues of all the things that God could have spoken. You have to remember that, you know, for, you know the, 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 the scholars, they speak of this 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, that there was no, there wasn't no open revelation of the Father for 400 years, and God breaks his silence, he speaks audibly, and the first thing that he speaks, is says, he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, or this is my beloved son. In other words, I love this man. That's, that is, that, I mean, it's fascinating, it's strange, it's bewildering, it's what is going on over here, except to say this, that the God of all glory, the God of all wisdom, that when he speaks audibly and he speaks publicly in that way, I mean, he's making a very, 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 very important statement. And so what we see in John 13 to 17 is we see how much of the understanding of the Father's love for the Son becomes the anchor or it becomes a foundation out of which uh, the, our, our, uh, our understanding of love is built. Again, John 59, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. But John 17, 23 says, as the Father has loved me, so the Father has, has loved you. And of course, Jesus in John 13, 34, he says that we ought to love one another as Christ has loved us. And then we can simply add John 59 to that by saying that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us, as Christ has loved us the way the Father has loved Christ. And so it always goes back to the fundamental understanding of how the Father loves the Son is the thing that equips our hearts to understand the true nature of love. And so Jesus tells us to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to abide there. Now, when the scripture talks about the love of God, Though there are emotional components to it, the subject of joy, the subject of delight, uh, the subject of his pleasures, it is, it, it is important to note, however, that the New Testament, where the New Testament goes, I believe primarily when it comes to the subject of understanding the subject of love, it goes to the issue of the sacrificial nature of love that is revealed in the cross. And so we see two primary things in the New Testament where God's love is revealed. It's revealed in the context of understanding the cross, number one, and it's revealed in understanding the story between the Father and the Son. One of the things that the subject does of understanding the Father's love of the Son, it is the, it truly, in my opinion, it truly is the big, Picture in which you and I are called to live. One of the most, uh, one of the more fascinating things to think about and just to ponder on and to interact with the Lord on is that even right now, as we're sitting in this room together, there is a conversation happening around the throne between the two most beautiful persons ever. The Father and the Son are in perfect fellowship in dialogue with uh, uh, with each other and when Jesus gets baptized the father 
uh, brings an awareness to, uh, uh, to the human race. Say, look, there is a bigger picture. There's something bigger going on than the, uh, than, the, uh, than the politics of the hour, than the moral crisis, though we're going to deal with the moral crisis, than the, than the theological issues, though we're going to deal with the theological issues. There is something bigger going on. There's a conversation between me and my son. And so in John 15, 9, what the Lord calls us to, he calls us at least to, uh, to four things. Number one, he calls us to awareness. He calls us to awareness, to abide in the Father's love is to grow in awareness, Holy Spirit awareness that there is a conversation taking place around the throne between the Father and the Son. It, it, there is this divine romance, as it were, that is taking place. God loving God, God enjoying God, God in fellowship with God. I mean, isn't that interesting, right? That, I mean, think about all the things that are happening in the earth. And these are things that break his heart. Isaiah 59 makes it very clear that, that God's heart is broken into pieces when it comes to the subject of injustice. Yet, in the midst of all of that, there is something deep going on in the fellowship of God, and that is that God is enjoying God. And when the Lord spoke audibly on that day, he was beginning his program, so to speak, of raising our awareness and connecting us with that reality because that, I believe, is part is a significant part of the big picture. That is a conversation taking place between the Father and the Son. Number two is that there is a conversation taking place that we are invited to participate in. And so it's not enough to be aware. We start with awareness, but then we realize that, hey, we have a participation in that conversation. That we can participate in the conversation that the Father has with the son, and again, a part of what has happened in John 13 to 17 is this just, I mean, there's so much insight, and there's other passages in the scripture as well that show us the conversation that is taking place between the father and the son. And before we're, we're done tonight, we're actually gonna look at one of those passages. Thirdly, so we have awareness. Number two, we enter into the conversation. And number three, we begin to experience transforming encounters. In other words, where we are dialoguing, we're, we're entering into the conversation, and what happens is there's a transformation that takes place in our lives. Where we get conformed more and more into the likeness of the Son. And then fourthly is partnership. That as we, um, that we get, we, we begin to get, we, we, uh, we begin to gain insight into God's divine agenda and in terms of how we can partner with him. As I mentioned earlier, that the, that the beginning point for us when it comes to love has to be the cross. It cannot just simply be a sentiment because that is the beginning point of culture. And again, there are profound and holy emotions that are found in the heart of God that we want to experience. In fact, part of what it means to be a man or a woman after God's own heart is to, is to know what it is that he's thinking and feeling. But it is important that we understand it in the context of the cross because, there is, because when Jesus talks about the great demonstration of his love in John 15, he says, there's no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. Romans tells us that God demonstrated love. God put love on display that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, in the first two verses, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 8, um, John calls us to live lives of love. He says, beloved, let us love one another, he says, but then in verses 9 and 10, he defines the nature of love. He says, now this is love. Not that we first loved God, but that he first loved us and gave himself as a propitiation for our sins, pointing us back to the glorious reality of the cross. And oftentimes when Paul calls us to love, he calls us to imitate the love of Christ as manifested in the context of the cross which incidentally, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the first expression of love, therefore, of the cross is forgiving love. That oftentimes when uh, the apostles call us to community, 
and he calls us to communal love. He is actually calling us, they're calling us to forgiving love, to love as Christ even love as manifested in the context of the cross. Okay, so back to John 15, 9. How did the Father love the Son? How did the Father love the Son? Again, uh, undoubtedly, uh, we're talking about his affections. Isaiah 40, uh, 42, it says, Behold my servant in whom is all my delight. And so we know that the love of the Father is this holy delight that he likes and he enjoys this man. He enjoys his son and that uh, he, invites into, into, he invites us into the experience of that. Uh, we know from John, uh, excuse me, from Psalm 16 that at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore, that all of God's pleasures are right there at the right hand with the Son of God, that we can experience that. But again, as I mentioned earlier, both of these, as, and again, they're critical, they're very, very, very important, uh, they are affective. In other words, they have to do with the emotion, they have to do with the, uh, uh, with, uh, with the sense of the experiencing and feeling feeling of how God feels about his son. But there are other passages where Jesus gives us insight into what it means that the father loves his son. And what is interesting is that when Jesus says, as the father has loved me, so I have loved you, and the two passages we're going to look at in just a moment, in the way that the father loved his son, the apostles on several occasions says, hey, church, he goes, these things are true about you as well. The first one is found in John chapter 3, verse 35. John chapter 3, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. The Father loves the Son and he's given all things into his hands. I mean, that is like, wow. I mean, that's absolutely amazing to think about that. But what's even more amazing is that Jesus comes along in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, and he says, he, he says, my dear children, he says, do not be afraid. He says, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, it's the father's good pleasure to put all things into your hands as well. So there's an inheritance. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 22, Paul says to the church of Corinth, he says, don't you know that all things are yours, he says. He might as well have said, the Father loves you. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. So John 3.35, the father loves the son. I'm going to put the little parentheses there. Therefore, he has an inheritance for him. But even as the father has an inheritance for the son, the son has that inheritance for you and me. John 5, verse 20, it's the next passage. It says, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Say this again. The father loves the son, and he shows him all that the father is doing. There, there is a, there's a revelatory dimension. There is a revealing of the father's heart. Because the father loves his son, the father discloses himself to his son. And so Jesus, in John 15, 9, he tells us that as the Father has loved me, in other words, as the Father has shown me all things, so I show you all things. In fact, he makes that point, Jesus does, in John 15, verse 15. He talks about us being his friends. Why? Because all that which the Father has declared to him, he's declared it to his disciples. He's made those available to his people. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, I love, I love that verse. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. The Father gave 
the book of Revelation to the Son of God. The Son of God gave that revelation to an angel, and the angel gave it to John, and John gave it to the church, but it was the Father who gave it to his Son. So what is happening in the book of Revelation, it is the revealing of the love of the Father for the Son of God. And so the thing that's interesting about this is that in our, in our midst, you know, we've got intimacy and urgency, as it were. We've got these two giant subjects that the Lord has entrusted our spiritual family with. But it's very easy to compartmentalize these two. And my hope tonight is to put a vision in front of us that we really can, uh, we can really walk and chew gum at the same time. And that is that as we are reading the book of Revelation, as we're reading the 150 chapters, we're whispering to the Father, Father, would you show us your affections for your son? Because that is in fact what is happening in these passages. It is the unveiling of the Father's love and affection for his son. Psalm 2, let's go ahead and turn there. Psalm 2 is uh, one of those passages where the Father's love, the Father's commitment for his son is shown forth. Again, we can read these passages, Psalm 2. We can read Isaiah 2. We can read Revelation 4 and 5. We can read Revelation 17. And as we're reading them and as we're studying them, Take moments just to pause and say, Father, would you show me your, the affections for your son? Father, thank you that you love your son. Show me more. Because what is happening as we're reading these passages, we are reading about the unveiling of the father's, son, uh, the father's love for his son. The Psalm 2 is a psalm that as we uh, ponder it, it touches our heart with delight it touches our heart with wonderment, and if we read it correctly, it even touches our heart with offense. It, it challenges us because it, is, it exposes areas and where we are in disagreement with the love of God. Yet the Spirit invites us through the Son of God, abide in my love, that we're to enter into that conversation. Now again, Psalm 2, it's, it, it takes place in the context, it shows, uh, firstly, it shows itself in the context of the first coming. There are several references in the New Testament where Psalm 2 gets referenced in the context of Jesus' uh, uh, first coming, but it undoubtedly has that full climax fulfillment in the generation of the Lord's return. Uh, next to Psalm 110, the, uh, uh, the most referred to Psalm in the New Testament is uh, uh, the, the, uh, is Psalm 2. Uh, both of these psalms, they give profound insight into, again, the beauty of Jesus. But instead of saying the beauty of Jesus, it's really seeing how the Father sees the Son, which is beautiful. When we're talking about the beauty of Jesus, we're talking about seeing the Son the way the Father sees him, which is Beautiful. Now, both of these psalms, Psalm 110 and Psalm 2, or we're going to focus on Psalm 2, they, I believe, they are essential to understanding the gospel of the kingdom. More and more today, more than ever, we are in need of understanding the gospel. The gospel is not only a message to this world, but it's also a message to the church. The apostle Paul in Romans chapter one, he tells the church of Rome, he says, I'm longing to come to you that I might preach the gospel to you also. The gospel is a message uh, for the church. Now, unfortunately, we're living in a time and the Holy Spirit is he's going to help us with this. But I wanna say this, there is no other message other than the gospel. I think I lost half of you guys, but now I'm gonna try to lose the other half. There is no other message except the gospel. And we've gotten so accustomed to 
So and so got this message, so and so got that message, so and so got this assignment, so and so got that. We got all of these very clever entrepreneurial, Western individualistic things. But when you read the New Testament very carefully, there's one message it's the gospel. And it is vast. Now, yes, there are different ones that the Lord uses to have an emphasis within the gospel, but as long as we understand that they are an emphasis, part of a bigger whole. But there's one message, and it is the gospel. And uh, the thing that's interesting is that the apostle Paul tells us in Galatians, he said there is a, he says that he did not receive the gospel taught by men, but he received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That it is, the thing that lies before us is to ask the Father to do what he enjoys doing the most by the Holy Spirit, and that is to speak to us about his Son. Paul says that it pleased God who formed me and separated him from his mother's womb to reveal his son in him that he might preach him to the nations. And so the thing that's gonna help us grow in the understanding of the gospel is understanding the revelation of Jesus Christ or the way we said it earlier, in understanding the way the father sees this man. It is the, the gospel is the word of the Lord. There are about seven or eight references in the New Testament where the gospel is referred to as the word of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, he talks about the second coming of Jesus. He says, we know this by the word of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, he goes, let the word of the Lord run swiftly. He's talking about the gospel because there is not just an information component to the gospel. There is a, uh, there's a, uh, there's a prophetic dimension of the gospel in that it's consistent with the message of the prophets, number one. And there is that subjective element of the prophetic that comes along when the gospel is being proclaimed. That's why the angel tells John in Revelation 19.10, he says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And again, when we talk about the spirit of prophecy, um, usually we talk about it in the context of, of an um, ed- uh, edification, exhortation, comfort, and, 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 that, and that applies. But in the context of Revelation 19 or the book of Revelation, when he talks about The spirit of prophecy, he's talking about the spirit of the prophets. He said the spirit of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Jonah. He goes, their message, the angel tells John, is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is his narrative. It is his story. For those of you who are taking notes, I have this sentence over here. The gospel is the narrative of the leadership of the God of Israel. The gospel is the narrative of the leadership of the God of Israel that is made manifest through the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the return of Jesus Christ, who is the son of Abraham and the son of David. The gospel is the narrative of the leadership of the God of Israel manifested through through the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the return of Jesus Christ who's the son of Abraham and the son of David. It really is our only true hope and joy and peace as we gain insight 
into that narrative. But why am I talking about the narrative? Because it is the understanding of the narrative where we discover the father's love for the son. Remember, he says that because the father loves the son, John 13, 34, he's given all things into his hands. And so when we're talking about the study of the end times, we're talking about the unfolding of the father's leadership as he manifestly puts everything under his son's feet. It is a story of divine love. The father's radical commitment to his son. Psalm 2, I, I, have a, I, I try to think of titles for chapters just for my own little thinking. And uh, the title that I have for, for, for Psalm 2 is How God's Jealous Love Conquers the Rage of the Nations. Psalm 2 is How God's Jealous Love conquers the rage of the nations. Because what we see in Psalm 2 is the father giving all things into his son's hand. In fact, he tells him, he says, ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. I will put all things into your hands. Ask me for it. I'll give it to you. Why? Because I love you. It is about the love of the father. Psalm 2 is a psalm uh, that is deeply filled with contrasting emotions. It's intense. There is the, the rage of the nations. There is the father's deep affection for his son. Then there is the father's deep displeasure with the nations. Then there is the father's deep Revealing of his uh, 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 of the son of his love, and we'll talk about it just a moment as it relates to the resurrection. And then we see the call of the nations to love the son in the same way that the father loves the son. When read slowly, it's, it is almost like an emotional roller coaster. Found in that chapter again, Psalm chapter two, verses one to three. It is the rage of the nations. Verses one to three, the rage of the nations. Verses four to five is the father's deep displeasure with the nations. Why? Because they don't share in his affections for his son. I mean, how much does the father love the son? Well, Jesus told some, <laughs> Jesus told some, that was a nervous laugh. Uh, Jesus told some, uh, he told some uh, very interesting parables. Like the father loves his son and the father says, hey guys, he goes, my boy is getting married. He goes, everybody show up. And a bunch of guys decided to push not coming on the Evite. And he sent the armies his armies to burn down their towns. The father loves his son. And he wants the nations to share in that love. And when they don't, that is something he shares very personally. Verses uh, two to seven, we see God's deep and holy affections for his son. When he declares, you are my son to that begotten. And we'll look at that in just a few moments, why I believe it uh, uh, relates to the affections of his, uh, for his son and related to the resurrection. In chapter two, verses nine to 11, now the son carries the wrath of the father and releases the Father's discipline on the nations. And in chapter two, verses 10 to 12, we are called into a fearful, joy-filled worship of the Son of God, and it's called wisdom to love him. Psalm two, again, as I mentioned earlier, it is filled with paradoxes. Because in it, we see God's attitude 
uh, towards a dark and a resistant world. We see God's attitude towards a dark and a resistant world. The nations really do rage and they come against the Messiah. Acts chapter four, verse 27, by putting him on the cross. Acts 4, 29, by persecuting his bride. Revelation 13, by having evil legislation that go against the word of God. Revelation 17, by seeking to oppose Jesus when he returns. And yet, here's the most bizarre thing about <laughs> Psalm 2. And this is the part that I said earlier when it says, you read it very carefully, you kind of go, what? It says, why do the nations rage? The people plot a vain thing. These nations are angry with God. These nations are resistant against God. They go against the word of God. They want to do away with the word of God. These nations. And the father looks at his son and he says, son, I love you so much. I have a gift for you. And the, father, the son goes, what's the gift? He goes, it's them. It's a fixer-upper. <laughs> he says, I have so loved you, Jesus, I put all things into your hand. And I imagine Jesus going, Proverbs 8, he goes, I love it, he said, because my delight is in the sons of men. You're like, what is going on over here? <laughs> He goes, I rejoice in the inhabited world. He goes, my delight is in the sons of men. All the while the nations are raging with a demonic rage against God and his son. It's absolutely amazing. In fact, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. It is in Acts chapter 13, verses uh, 32 and 33, where the apostle Paul quotes Psalm 2, referring to the resurrection. He said that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead by this holy, affectionate decree of the Father. It says, you are my son. But the implication of Jesus being raised from the dead means that he died. He died for this rage-filled nation. Why? Because his delight is in the sons of men. He rejoices in his inhabited world. And Psalm 2 is a passage that is filled with paradoxes. What we see in Psalm 2, verses 4 to 5, where we see the Father's deep displeasure against the nations, and we find out from other passages that that, dis, that that displeasure, that that anger, that wrath that came upon the Son of God, the Son of God received that very wrath for the sake of these raging nations. And according to Revelation, making him worthy and equipped to confront the nations with zeal because he was slain. One of the things that we need in this hour, we need a clear a Holy Spirit theology of the cross uh, that reveals not only his love and his grace, but also his righteous judgment. And that God is righteous in releasing his divine discipline over the nations. Psalm 2 connects our heart with the Father's deep affections for his son at the resurrection. I just love it. The decree that raised the son from the dead. Acts 13, Paul says, but God raised him from the dead. Acts 13, verse 30, verse 31. He was seen for many days by those who, uh, who, came, up, uh, who came up with him from Galilee and Jerusalem who were witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, a promise which God made to the fathers. And God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says, as it is also written in the second Psalm. 
you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. You know, when the father in Matthew 3, 17 says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Part of what he was shouting was saying, he was saying, this is the one. The one from Psalm 2. That's him. (laughs) That is him. He goes, all my pleasure is in that man. All of it. And I invite you to become acquainted with that love because I have put all things in that man's hand, number one and number two, and I show him all things and I have commissioned him to tell you that he loves you in the exact same way that I love him and I've commissioned him to tell you that I love you in the exact same way that I, that, uh, uh, that I love him. Therefore, all things are in your hands and I will show you all things as well. And so when we begin to read these passages, the, the 150 chapters. Again, it's, you know, sometimes we just, these, these just become phrases in our midst. And I'm like, ah, I go, Lord, help us to see that it is the story of your love between, your, between you and your son. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. That there is the experience of deep intimacy in those passages because it is the unveiling again It is what the Father has shown the Son, he now is showing us through his word. The declaration of the Father over the sons at the resurrection is, you are my son. So strong is this affection that it raised Christ from the dead. So strong is that love that it broke the courts of death. It is as though the Song of Solomon had it right, that love is stronger than the grave. That seal that the Father put on his son, according to John 6, 27, Jesus says, you know, we talk about, you know, say, Lord, would you set, myself, set yourself as a seal upon my heart? And the Father goes, but I set myself as a seal upon my son. I set my affections upon him. And it was a shout of my affection. You are my darling son that broke the power of the grave. You know, it is as though at the end of the age, Jesus will come back with all of his angels and he will shout, you know, I don't know. It says he comes with a shout. What does he shout? I don't know, but maybe we can guess. Maybe he says something like this to the church. You are my bride. And that love breaks the power of the grave. And we enter into the resurrection. I don't know what the shout is. But the shout of the father to the son broke the power of the grave. The Holy Spirit's number one agenda is to win multitudes of those enraged nations against the Son of God and to bring them into the Father's love for the Son. Psalm 2 is a psalm that is designed to help us to grow in love for the Son. Psalm 2 is about the glory of the Lord filling the earth, full of the adoration of the Father manifested in terms, of, in terms of the manifestation of his love for his son. It's absolutely amazing that when Jesus returns, the nations will say, Psalm, Psalm 1-3, rightly do they love you. Rightly do they love you. And so, when Jesus tells us how the worship team comes up, and when Jesus says, look, he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. We have got three areas where we can go to in terms of growing in that love. One, 
the one that we're familiar with, the, the subject of his affections. We, the father has real, holy affections for his son. Number one. And number two, growing in our understanding of the cross and the sacrificial nature of love. Uh, not only as a propitiation for our sin, as a price, as a payment for our sins, but also a model of how we are to live and what love looks like. And thirdly, entering into the, uh, the, the passages that give us insight into what the Father's plans are for his Son. Because in those plans, they flow out of a deep affection for the Son. And again, we can study the subject of the end times while we're whispering to the Father, say, Father, thank you for loving your Son. Show us more. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Beloved, it's so amazing. A couple of hundred, hundred of us in this room, we've all have had different things happen today and different challenges and different blessings and a whole range of moods. Some are maybe even leaving this building into a difficult situation. We, this is life under the sun. And yet, in the midst of all of that, there is a conversation taking place around the throne. And, and part of the glory that we have as believers is that we can tap into that conversation as we are walking through, again, the challenges of life. Whether it be family challenges, relational challenges, work challenges, whatever they may be, health challenges. There is a bigger conversation going on and we get to be a part of it. But Father, here we are. We touch us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Jesus. Father, your affections for your son. Show us more. Father, even as we read your word, show us your affections for your son. As we study the things about your plan and the days that lie ahead, show us the affections for your son. Lord, for all of us, Lord, would you just release, Father, just new dimensions, new deposits, new experiences in the Holy Spirit of your love for your Son. In the night seasons, would you cause our hearts to instruct us? Open up our eyes to your law. Father, even in fellowship, Lord, where suddenly, Lord, there's these nuggets of understanding of your affection for your son. Father, give us more.
If the Lord is touching in any kind of way, or, or if you'd like to receive prayer for anything that's on your heart, for healing, or, or you want someone to stand with you in prayer, or the Lord is touching you, let's go ahead and invite you to come to the front. We're going to have different ones praying for you. Again, it could be prayer for anything. It could be the Lord touching you, or you need for healing, or you just have a burden on your heart, you want someone to pray with you. need a couple people just to pray for the ones who are standing here. Our Encounter God service starts at 7.30. Nathan Steele is going to do a part two from last week. Last week was absolutely phenomenal. He's going to do a part two from next week, from last week. And it'll also be coffee and we serve in the bookstore. God bless you guys. So need a few people to come in and pray for the ones here in front.